All right, take your Bibles, if you will, please, and go with me to Joshua chapter 1, or excuse me, Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 3, and I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite places in all the world, and uh, listen, it is such a great place, I just go down here by myself, sit on the front row, and two good-looking chicks come and sit by me, I mean, amen, <laughs> where else does that happen, come on, amen, I hate to tell you girls, but I am married, come on, right there, amen, and my wife is here, I'm glad she's here. Uh, she asked me, she said, are you going to preach something new? I said, not to you. Come on, amen. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I'm glad to be able to be here, and I'm thrilled. Uh, I, I know so many of you in here, many of you don't know this, but uh, I was driving through Lubbock one day, drove under a bridge, saw Brother Stacy, bought him a taco, and he came over here and went to church. Can I get an amen? <laughs> God bless Brother Stacy. Amen. And, and, uh, and, and I love Brother Jerry back there. Many people don't know of his affliction, but I've tried to help him with his four toes. Come on, everybody, say amen to that. But uh, I'm glad he's here. And, of course, uh, I, I love the Downers. There's no doubt that our family loves the Downers. My son, Braxton, uh, my daughter, Brooklyn, they love Chris and Trish. And, uh, man, my daughter's in Bible college in California. Uh, my son is on a reprieve, but he'll be back out there next semester. And uh, it's an amazing thing to be able to have watched those kids grow up, and they love you. Uh, we were at camp one year, and uh, Braxton uh, had a severe underbite, and Trish walked up and said, I can fix that. I said, my goodness, she's a Benny Hinn. She's going to fix him right here. But uh, no, she got him, and we'd come out here about every six weeks, every month, something like that, and Trish would get him fixed, and uh, he's so good looking now, he's getting married. Amen. And uh, it's, it's a great story, Chris. We were getting ready to drive out there, going to West Coast Baptist College, he and my, my daughter, and uh, we were going to drive his truck and drive my daughter's vehicle out to a out there, it's a long drive, and so we were leaving about four in the morning, and I was sitting in my daughter's car, and his truck was running, and I look up, and his mother is in his grill, so we get down the road, I said, what, what did your, what was your mother doing, what was she saying, he said, she said, you're from Texas, you'll date a girl from Texas, and you'll come back to Texas, well, he's engaged to a girl from New Zealand, <laughs> how many know that's pretty close to Texas, amen, so, but, uh, man, am I thrilled to be able to be here. Get your Bibles. Go to Joshua chapter 3. Man, that's great music tonight. I thank you. Great, great, great music tonight. And I want you to read with me just one verse. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse 10. And notice what it says. It says, and Joshua said. Now, I want you to say that. Say the word said. said. No, you've got to say it better than that. Say said. said. Now, listen, what does that mean? That means when you start saying something, there's a dynamic that happens. The Bible said out of Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, it says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. James, the half-brother Jesus, said these words. He said, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. As a matter of fact, the proverb says, Out of the mouth proceeds life and death. So, hey, Joshua, who is the leader right now, is saying something. I, I want you to know words matter. I want you to know what you say, where you say, how you say it matters. As a matter of fact, according to my wife, tone matters. So just know this, Joshua is saying something. Words have power. You've heard him say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never... How many know that's a lie? Come on, how many know that? It's just not true. Words have power. And Joshua is saying something. It says, and Joshua said, hereby we shall know. We shall know that not the dead God, but the living God. Come on, amen. He's not dead, he's alive. That the living God is among us, or among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hiveites, and the Perizzites, and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into our text. Our Father, thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house, and God, especially this house. I love these people. I love this pastor. So thankful, God, for he and Trish and their faithful lives and their awesome kids. And God, what a thrill it is to come in here tonight and worship and have the name of Jesus Christ lifted up. And God, I pray you'd remind us one day every knee's going to bow. And every tongue's going to confess that he, Jesus, is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so God, I thank you for the word of God, that it's in there and it's infallible, that God, you've given it to us tonight, that we might make application to us. God, I recognize we don't know Joshua in the flesh, but God, we can know the struggles and we can know the burdens, and we can know, God, how you used his life, and take that same thing and use it in our life. So I pray, God, if there's somebody in this building who has never been saved, 
They've never passed from death to life. If they were to die right now, they'd wake up in hell. God, I pray this would be the night they'd get saved. I pray this would be the night they'd meet Jesus. You know, God, for that somebody who's been saved, God, your word says, wilt thou not revive us again? God, that's what we're asking. Send revival to our hearts. Send revival to our lives. Our nation needs revival, but God, it won't start in the nation. It'll start here with us. So God, speak to us. And God, in advance, we're going to thank you for what you do. Because it's in Jesus' mighty name we do pray. And good and loud. Now, everybody said. Amen. Anytime you start studying the Bible, you have to put it in what is known as the context of which it's being spoken. In other words, you just can't take a verse and say, well, it means this to me. It means this to my mom. It means this to my grandma. No, you have to know what God intended when he wrote it down. The Bible said every word of God has a power within itself for its own fulfillment. The Bible said of itself that it's quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing sunder, soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner, here it is, of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. So when you look into the Word of God, you might be reading the Word. I might be reading the Word. But I got good news for you. When you read the Word, the Word is reading you. So when we come to this passage, what do we find out? We find out that in chapter 1 it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses gave us the first five books of the Bible. Moses gave us the Pentateuch. Moses gave us the Ten Commandments. You start thinking about Moses and you think about his life. When he was a boy, they tried to kill him off. When he was a boy, they tried to, to take his family and run him out of town. But, oh, man, the Bible said Jochebed and Amram, they had faith, and they did not buy into the king's commandments. And the Bible said they put him in a basket. They sent him down a river. He began to cry. As he began to cry, it just so happened at the right time that Pharaoh, who had given out the decree that his daughter was there, she picks him up. She brings him in. The Bible said that his mother then take, takes care of him because of his sister. And old friend, it's an amazing story because he now lives the next 40 years in the palace. And in the palace, he had the king's meat. He had the king's education. He had the king's dignities. He, he had everything that the king had. He was the king's grandchild. And old friend, then the Bible says at 40 years of age, he goes out, he spies an Egyptian, treating one of his kinsmen cruelly. You say, how in the world did that happen? I'll tell you how. He had a mom and daddy that said, you're not from Pharaoh, you're from God's people. Amen. And so the Bible said he goes out and he murders a man. Now, don't you get that? He's a murderer. You say, at that moment, God's done with him. No, I want you to remember, Paul was a murderer. David was a murderer, and now we know that Moses was a murderer. And the next day, he's going to do the same thing. And the Bible said, the man says, what? Are you going to do me the way you've done the man the day before? Are you going to take my life? And the Bible says he begins to run. I think the worst part of his life was not just the murder. The worst part of his life was not just getting away from Pharaoh. But when we find him at the, at the 40 year day, he's, he's sitting on a well. And the Bible said a man by the name of Jethro comes and rescues him. He then spends the next 40 years in anonymity. He spends the next 40 years hiding out. He spends the next 40 years, if I read it right, he's running from God. The most miserable people in all the world are not people that are lost. It's people that know God, but they're running from the will of God. He's running from God. And at 80, he looks up. And there's a burning bush, and that burning bush would not be consumed. And the Bible said God began to speak to him. He said, Moses, take off your shoes. Because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. You say, why was it holy? I'll tell you why. Because he was 80 and God was still calling out to him. He says, you ran for 40 years. You thought you were in charge. You went out to Jethro's. You thought you were done. But Moses, I've got you prepared. You're right where I want you. And the Bible said he began to call to him. Then we find him as he takes on Pharaoh. We find him as he takes on the plagues. We find him as he takes on all the difficulties from being the leader of the Hebrew people. And there comes a time. When Moses is told, hey, I want you to go over there and I want you to speak to the rock. I want you to get that. He said, speak to the rock. And instead of speaking to the rock, he goes over there, chews them out because they don't do what he wants them to do. He and Aaron go over there and say, hey, you're always a gainsaying. You're always a rebellious people. And instead of speaking to the rock, the Bible said he smites the rock. And God says to him, Moses, I told you to speak to it, and I, I saw you smite that rock. And he said, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. When you go to Deuteronomy 34, the Bible said he takes Moses up into a high perch. He looks out across that scenery. He said, there's the promised land. There's where you've been working to go. But you're not going to go. I don't understand it, Chris. I've studied it. I've looked at it. It doesn't make sense to me. But I want to tell you, when God says no, God means no. So now we have Joshua. 
Why? Because Moses, my servant, is dead. Everybody is going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. You know what that word appointed means? It means to be set, fixed, removable. Everybody in this room, if God tarries his coming, is going to die. The Bible said, go to now that you either say today or tomorrow you'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what should be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it's gone. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. Old friend Moses dies. And then the Bible said that there's a young man who's been his associate. His name is Joshua. And God begins to call Joshua. And the Bible says that Joshua's got all of his issues. As a matter of fact, in chapter 3, verse 7, it says, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. So that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Oh, friend, listen, God had a Moses, but now God has a Joshua, praise God. But now God says to him, hey, you've had your challenges at the Red Sea. You've had your challenges with Pharaoh. Moses was the leader, but now I want you to go across the Jordan River. If you go to verse 15 of chapter 3, the Bible said that the Jordan River is out of its banks. I don't know if you know, but you don't cross rivers when they're out of their banks. But I want to remind you something. The things that are impossible with man, praise God, they're possible with God. The Bible said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? You see, he doesn't want Joshua getting credit. He doesn't want Joshua getting full of themselves. Can I tell you, there's times in our lives when God takes us out there and we look around and nothing seems to make sense. And we hear that verse, lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That's exactly what's going to happen in Joshua chapter 3. God says, I'm going to lead this. I'm going to get the glory for this. You're not going to do this when this is easy. You're going to do what is impossible. You're not going to do it because you're good. You're not going to do it because you're worthwhile. You're going to do it because I'm going to give you the instructions to do it. And so when you come to the first part of chapter 3, what does he tell them? He says, I want you to attempt the impossible. Now listen, I don't know what's happening in your family. I don't know what's happening in your health. I don't know what's going on in your finances. Hey, I know we live in a world where the Bible said we're going to live in perilous times. How many know we're living in perilous times? You know, friend, I don't know what's going to happen in two days or 40 days. I don't know who's going to the White House. But I'll guarantee you when we get done, bless God, God's still going to be on the throne. So what do we find out? We find out that God says to Joshua, Joshua. I want you to attempt the impossible. I want you to do what you can't do. And oh, friend, know this. The situation is critical. Life is at a vulnerable state, and either Joshua and the people of God are going to go God's way, or they're going to flounder, and they're going to fall. What do they need? I'll tell you what they need. They need what we need. They need a supernatural intervention by God. Amen. So what do we have in the first four verses? We have them preparing for the crossing. Say that word. Say preparing. preparing. Try it again. Say preparing. preparing. There is a preparing for the crossover. Look at what it says in verse 1. Because it says early. Now, I don't know about you, but early is not one of my favorite times of the day. Can I get a witness right there? Let, let's just take a vote right now. How many of you like to get up early? Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. Later, Brother Chris will be casting out your demons. Can I tell you that? Amen. <laughs> if you like to get up early, you've never slept till noon and gone and eat Mexican food. <laughs> and by the way, when you get to heaven, you won't call Jesus Jesus. You'll call him Jesus. Come on right there. The whole world's in a mess right now because they got in a fight over fajitas. If you read your Bible, man. But, oh, friend, hey, he, he says to him, I want you to get early. You know what that means? He says, I want you to get prepared. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that here it is, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. But here it is, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know you'll never do anything for God? I'll never do anything for God if I don't have a transformed mind. The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, friend, it's not a matter of are we going to bow, it's just when are we going to bow. You know what he says? He says, get yourself prepared. Now, James, the half-brother Jesus, said, if you'll draw nigh to God, it says he'll draw out of you. You're not waiting on God. 
God is waiting on you. Hey, the Bible said the grace of God has appeared unto all men. I don't care who you are. If you're in this building today, I can tell you according to the word of God, it's not God's will that you would die and go to hell. Friend, you listen to me. The Bible said in John 3, 16, David quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the next verse says this. It says he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You go to 2 Thessalonians, you know what it says? It says people go to hell not because they're bad. People go to hell not because they didn't go to Sunday school. People go to hell not because uh, they didn't get baptized. No, the Bible said because they would not receive the love of the truth. It says because of this, they shall receive in themselves their own damnation. Hey, hey, God doesn't send anybody to hell. We send ourselves to hell when we reject Jesus Christ. You know, friend, you look at this. He tells them get ready early. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, it says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Why? You don't know you're going to be here tomorrow. So they get prepared early. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether you eat or you drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And so there's a time of waiting in verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord. Shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with the wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Can I tell you the most difficult word in the Bible for Clark is to wait. Come on, amen. By the way, Brother Chris, that's why I like Mexican food. You know why? Because you sit down and start eating. Can I get an amen? You're not waiting on the food, the food's right there in front of you, amen. And by the way, I like sweet tea with a lot of ice. Can I get a witness in the house? The Lord don't like lukewarm and neither does Clark. Come on, amen. So, so wait, he says to wait. I'm the guy that stands in front of the microwave and says, hurry up. And can you imagine after all the time, Brother Chris, they, they'd waited 40 years. Now, now their leader, Moses, is not going to take them through. And they've been waiting and God comes back and says, wait again. There are times in life when you and I have to realize that God's not telling us no, but God's telling us to wait. Why? Because God is never late, he's never in a hurry, and he's always right on time. God knows what's best. God knows what's right in your life. And he says to him, he says to wait. You come to verses 3 and 4, and he gives them a command. Why? Because the commands of God are meant to be followed, and when we follow the commands of God, the blessings of God come to our life. Moses gave us Exodus chapter 20 where we had the Ten Commandments. By the way, I think we'd be all right in our culture if we went back to the Ten Commandments. But, but, but here what you, here's what you find out. He gives them commands, and here's the command. I want you to get this. He gives them commands to follow the ark of God. Everybody say ark. Say, say it again. I want you to get it. Say ark. ark. Now, wait a minute. What was the ark, and what did it represent? It represented what we all want in our lives. It, it represented what was most meaningful in all of our lives. He, it represented the presence of God. You go to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. You know what it says? It says there are times of refreshing that come from the presence of God. There's nothing like being in God's presence. You can't manufacture it. You, you can't drum it up. You can't fake it up. You can't just go through the motion. No, there's something about knowing, just knowing you're in the presence of God. Amen. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 16 and verse 11, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know why we have the longing heart? You know why we have the problems that we have? I've got statistics here talking about people taking their lives, talking about alcoholism, talking about drugs, talking about loneliness. They're all over the map. You can go to the National Center for Statistics, and they'll tell you, we live in a, in a very miserable society. And you know what every one of them is looking for? They're looking for a right relationship with God. Because you can never be at peace with yourself, with your family, with your job, with your... You cannot be at peace with anyone until you've made your peace with God. The book of Philippians says, Great peace have they which love thy law. Oh, friend, there's something about a peace that passeth all understanding. Oh, friend, there's the peace of God that you cannot buy. The peace of God that you, you probably don't even understand. But, oh, friend, the peace of God and the presence of God is what changes our lives. You see, he had told them to prepare. Can I tell you, it's right. It is right to be in the house of God. Come on, amen. It's amazing to me. My mama, 
uh, is from Oklahoma. Everybody say Oklahoma. Let me tell you the best thing about Oklahoma. You don't live there. Come on, amen. If you look up Oklahoma in Greek, it means casino. If you ever see a good-looking girl in Oklahoma, she's a visitor. Anybody from Oklahoma? You ain't going to tell me now, are you? Amen. My mama's from Oklahoma. And uh, th th there was a time in her life. When they did what was called a two-week revival, my mama got saved on the last day of a two-week revival. Can you imagine that, Brother Chris? My people are trying to get out the building before we get done. Come on, amen. <laughs> they told me, one guy left, I called him later. I said, where were you going? He said, the Cowboys were playing. I said, pal, the Cowboys hadn't played in 30 years. <laughs> Cowboy fans are like old Baptist churches. We're living in the past. How about that, CJ? Come on right there. Amen. You know she used to be a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Did you know that? Come on. Very, very little people, very few people know that, but I just wanted to share that with everybody. Amen. But my mama got saved on the second week of a two-week revival. Let me tell you something. I'm telling you, Monday night and Tuesday night, if you're a child of God, you ought to be here, bless God, and you ought to have somebody with you. Come on, amen. Hey, how in the world? Do we tell everybody we love Jesus and the church matters and Jesus is coming back? If the things of God don't matter to us, the Bible said forsake not the assemblies of ourselves together. And it says and so much more as you see the day approaching. The Bible said I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the most important thing going on is what goes on at the house of God. Amen. And old friend, you know what they found out? They found out when they got their priorities right. They found out when they sought out God. Well, by the way, if you're in here today and you're not saved, get saved. Come on, amen. And if you're saved and you haven't been baptized, get baptized. Why? Because you identify with church, the resurrection, the death, burial. Uh, you, you identify with the incoming or the, the, the return of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things happen. Do it God's way. Amen. And then all of a sudden the Bible says this. They were preparing for the crossing over. And then in verses 5 through 13, there was the consecration for the crossing. Verse 5 says they began to sanctify. Now, I'm making you say a lot of words, but say sanctify. sanctify. There's, there's two connotations to that word. Number one, they were to be dedicated. I don't care who you are. You cannot succeed in life if your endeavors you're not dedicated to. The Bible said come out from among them and be a separate. We're not like everybody else. We're not called to be like everybody else. And so he said, hey, not only to be dedicated, but to be set apart, to be different, to be distinct is really what that means. You're not like everybody else. Can I tell you, praise God, it's amazing to me how the church is like the world and the world could care less. Come on, amen. We're not going to reach the world trying to be like the world. We need to reach the world trying to be like Jesus. So what do we do? We dedicate. We're set apart. Uh, you see, before they moved, they were to be still they were to wait on God. God began to magnify Joshua in verses 6 and 7. In verse 8, they were to stand still. Uh, Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. You know what that word still means? It means to withdraw. You see, if you're going to walk with God, you can't run around with everybody else. At times, you've got to get alone. You've got to get by your Bible. You've got to get in a closet and close the door and say, I'm not leaving here until God speaks to me. I'm not leaving here until I sense his presence. I'm not leaving here until I get an answer. There are times when you've got to withdraw. Be still and know. That word know means to know by experience. It's called a test of your faith. We, we talk about testimonies. Can I tell you, you cannot have a testimony until you have a test of your faith. You go read Hebrews chapter 11. Chris would probably preach through it. And you know what you find out? Hey, those great saints of God, they all had their faith tested at some point or another. You're not the only one to go through trouble. The Bible said, all you who live God in Christ Jesus, it says you're going to suffer persecution. The Bible said to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if the world hates me, it'll hate you. You've got to take a stand, even when you don't understand it, when people don't like it. Hey, friend, the Bible said your faith will be tested. Verse 9 says, hear the word. Verse 10 says, there's victory coming. Verse 11 talks about the ark of the presence. And in verse Isaiah 43 and verse 2, it says, I will be with thee. And then in verses 12 and 13, he tells them to cross over. Who crosses over in the middle of a swamp? Who crosses over during difficult times? 
You see, the Bible talks about how we're to be preparing for the crossing over, how there's a consecration for the crossing over, and then in verses 14 through 17, it talks about the completion of the crossing over. Now, hey, if God gives you a task, God means for you to do that task. It's not somebody else's task. It's not what God had called your neighbor to do. It's what God has called you to do. The Bible said no man... Having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. James said, hey, you want to show me your faith? I'll show you my works by my faith. I'm going to do something with my faith. Hebrews 11, again, every one of those guys, they were used greatly of God, but they were tested and tried greatly by God. And everybody that's ever been used by God has got to make that other side of that test. And may I say, praise God, there's victory coming to those that just hang on. Amen. And so what does he say to Joshua? you got to consecrate. Hey, you, you got to complete. you got to get to the other side. Hey, I don't want you to stay over here and moan for the next 40 years. I want you to load up, and I want you to go out. Hey, at some point, at some point, you have to make decisions that move you from where you're at to where God would have you to be. Hey, if you're in here today, and you're not saved, can I tell you, this is a grand day to get saved. You know, friend, if you're saved, but you're not really telling anybody. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 10, verse 32? It says, if you confess me before men, it says, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But verse 33 says, but if you deny me before men, it says, I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. We have an evangelist in our church, Tim Lee. And he has two great statements. He said, you don't have to go to heaven, and you don't have to go to hell, but you're not staying here. Come on, amen. And then he has another one. He said, if you want to really know you're saved, there's one fail-safe way to know it. And that is, you will not be ashamed. You'll want people to know it. Hey, you'll, you'll, you'll tell the world, hey, Jesus is my Savior. You'll tell the world I was dead in my trespasses, but now I'm alive in Jesus Christ. Oh, friend, I, I got saved when I was 13, Chris. I'd made a profession in the second grade. Let me tell you how that worked. In the second grade, we didn't have ESPN. We didn't have DVRs. Can I get an amen right there? We didn't even have beta. I'm so old. Come on, amen. As a matter of fact, when, when I was a kid, the Cowboys were good. How many remember that? Come on, amen. And we'd be watching the Cowboys, and if the reception didn't come in good, my dad would say, get up and go adjust the rabbit ears. Who knows about a rabbit ear right here? Let me tell you about rabbit ears. If Clark grabbed the rabbit ears and the reception came in better, I was going to watch the game like this. That's how that's going to work. And so I was in the second grade. It was Monday night football. There's no replays. And, and my, my sister had made a profession of faith earlier that week. And I began to ask my mom about it. She went and told the preacher. The preacher came over on Monday night. How many know preachers ought not be visiting on Monday night during Monday night football? Come on, amen. Just pick a better time, preachers, amen. But um, they came over. I'll never forget it. Hey, Clark, would you like to be saved? Bow your head. They bowed their heads. My mom and dad bowed their heads. I watched the Miami Dolphins kick a field goal. I watched them kick a field goal. That's when they were undefeated. I don't know how old that was, but I, I, I was young. And when they got done, they lifted up their heads, and they said, do you feel better? I'm like, hey, I feel great. Come on, amen. <laughs> Next Sunday, I walked the aisle. Next Sunday, I got baptized. And I was in school. I was in junior high. How many know junior high kids are very trained? How many know that? Amen. Come on, Amen. Mark Twain said all kids could be raised in a barrel with nothing but a knot hole to breathe through. Come on, amen. And when they become teenagers, that'll plug up the knot hole. Come on, amen. So I was, I was early teenager. And I go to camp. I get under conviction. And here's what I know. Nothing about my life said Jesus. Hey, nothing about my life said I was saved. And I came under conviction on Monday. I came under conviction on Tuesday. And on Wednesday night, I got saved. And I got to tell you, I, I, I argued about it. I waited about it. I, I, I said, man, I, did I do it in the second grade? Fine. I said, I, I, nothing about me has changed. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I was not a new creature. And when I got saved, I waited four years to be baptized. We were getting ready to take the Lord's Supper. And my pastor, Dr. Oldham, gave the Lord's Supper one time a year on Super Bowl Sunday night. Am I right, Dwayne? Amen. He'd say, bless God, if you don't want to watch it, if you want to go watch the Super Bowl, go watch it. God's people are going to have the Lord's Supper. Amen. And they'd lock the doors before you got going with the Lord's Supper because it was a sanctified moment. And he got to talking that morning about how if you're saved, 
then your baptism ought to follow your salvation. And if you haven't done that right, then your baptism's not right. He went to the book of Acts. He said, hey, who, were you baptized in John's baptism? Whose baptism were you baptized with? And I didn't have a good baptism. I, I had made a profession, but I wasn't saved. And then when I got saved, I didn't get baptized. Well, that day I walked out. My parents didn't know it. I said, Dr. Oldham, my baptism's out of order. I walked up, got baptized. I want to tell you, one of the great experiences of my life was when I got that right. You know what, I'd kicked it around for four years. I think God knew I was going to be a pastor, and I don't let people get saved and not get baptized. I'm like a church of Christ. you got to get baptized now. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll tell you this. When you go back and look at Joshua, and you go back and look at when they begin to cross it, the first part, get this, the first part in verses 14 and 15 to get across that river was the first step. There's a Chinese proverb. That says the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, the first one. You see, at some point, they had to start out across that wall. And by the way, when they started out across there, you know what they found out? They found out that God had blown back that water by his nostrils. Have you ever read that story about when you go back and he begins to take him across the Red Sea and he blew his nostrils? Hey, hey, God has the power to make your Red Seas turn into dry ground. Amen. And he did the same thing here for Jordan. He says, they'll, they'll come up on a heap. You say, what does that mean? When we get things right, God makes a way where there is no way. Amen. And then you find out in verse 16 that they won't move from faith to sight, that they were now in the saving business. Verse 17, the priests, the ark, the covenant of God, they stood firm on dry ground, and all people passed through clean over Jordan. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 18, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know. Here it is. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Three things and I'm done. Number one, they came to this place because it was predicted. Now I want to tell you something. Buddha can't predict. Muhammad can't predict. Confucius can't predict. And you and I cannot predict, but God can and hey, what does he do? He makes a covenant. There's a whole sermon in there about the covenant. Wait, well, hey, when God makes a promise, praise God, he keeps that promise. Amen. He's an immutable God. Numbers 23, 19, God's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it, or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? If God tells you he's going to do something, bless God, he gets it done. Amen. You know, friend, what do you find out? He predicted. Number two, the timing was not according to them. The timing was according to God. And by the way, it was the perfect timing. And then there's a third thing. It took place when no one but God knew it could happen. Hey, you say, what's the message to us? It may be that you're looking at the land of impossible. Your marriage, your kids, your finances, your health. I got news for you. God has the ability to move when you cannot move. I, um, I was talking to my wife, Tony Lynn, the other day. And we were talking about when it comes to October, that one October I was in Georgia preaching a revival. And I had come home five weeks in a row early because they said, your mom's not going to make it through the week. And Tony Lynn would call me, and I'd get on a plane, and I'd come back from wherever I was preaching. And so on this week, Tony Lynn, my dad said, hey, you go, go, you stay where you're at. Your mom is fine. You go preach your meeting. And so... I loaded up, go to Georgia, I'm preaching this meeting. They call me on Wednesday night right before church, and they say, we're not sure she's going to make it through the night. And so I, I get on a plane the next morning early, I buzz it back, Tony Lynn picks me up, and I go upstairs, and there at Baylor Medical Center on the sixth floor was my mama. She was down to 67 pounds. And hey, 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 listen to me. My mama was one of those ladies that would beat you and brag about it. Can I get an amen right there? Yeah, man, she would. You didn't mess with her. But there she was frail, there she was dying. And let me tell you the hardest part about it. Not that she was going to die, because listen, the Bible said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Come on, there's something. Hey, when believers die, they don't die, they go to their reward. They go to an inheritance that, praise God, is incorruptible. Hey, we don't die, we just change locations. Amen. But I thought to myself when we were done, I thought, wait a minute. There's some verses here. I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Henceforth, because of all this, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. 
Brother Chris, my mama had a crown. She was leaning against the wall because my brother was crazy. Can I get an amen? Yeah, he's crazy. But oh, man, listen. You're not done. I'm not done until God says we're done. Hey, 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 you know what he said to Joshua? I know Moses is gone. I know the river's swollen. But I'm not done with you. And by the way, if you're alive right now, hey, God's not done with you. Don't you bow your heads for just a moment? And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want us to get honest with ourselves and God. Who tonight could raise your hands and say, Brother Clark, I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. If you know that, raise your hands. Way up high. Come on, I know I'm saved. Put them right back down. And if you couldn't raise your hands, man, God bless you for being honest. It's easy to get in here and play church. That won't do you any good when you stand before God. God bless you for being honest. But let me ask you two or three questions. Those of you who just raised your hands. How many of you that are saved would say, Clark, I'm saved, but spiritually, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I need to be. I'm not where God would have me to be. If ever there was a time I need a revival, that time is now. Come on, who'll raise your hand up and say, that's me, I need revival. Amen. You put them right back down. I wonder who tonight would say, preacher, I'm saved, but I'm burdened. You don't have to tell me what that burden is, but there's something on your heart. Come on, let me see. There's, there's a burden on my heart. I wonder who tonight would say, preacher, pray for me, because I've got a friend, a family, or somebody that I know at work or at school, they're lost, and right now, God is laying that somebody on my heart. They need to be saved. Come on, let me see your hands. Just, I'm burdened for the lost. Amen. You can put them right back down. Now, listen, I'm going to pray. When I get done praying, I'm going to say amen. We're going to stand. David's going to sing. And on the first note, the first verse, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to leave your seat, start down these aisles, and get on these altars. Can I tell you, you can't have revival if you get away from an altar. Dwight Lyman Moody said, every great move of God can be traced back to a kneeling figure. Something happens when God's people pray. I'm going to do it tomorrow night. I'm going to do it Tuesday night. I don't think it's wrong to do it every night. Hey, at our church, we have, we, we have invitations because we know they matter to God. Every time God got ready to move, he brought, he, they made an altar, and they came to that altar. Something happens when you respond to the hearing of God's Word. Not to just be a hearer of the Word, but to be a doer and a heater of the Word. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come fall on these altars. I'm burdened. I need revival. Somebody I love is lost. But I want to ask this last question. I'm not going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to grab you. But I'd sure like to pray for you. Who in this building wouldn't raise your hand up and say, Preacher, if I died tonight, I'm not positive I'd go to heaven. Let me tell you, there's not a holding state. There's not an intermediate state. There's just a heaven or hell. So I'm going to ask you a question. If you died tonight, how many of you would say, Preacher, I don't know that I'd go to heaven, but I'll tell you this, I'm concerned enough about my eternity. Would you pray for me? Come on right now, just raise your hand up. Just slip it way up high, Preacher. I don't know that I'm saved. Just slip it way up high. You say, Clark, what do I do if I don't know? Well, you've got one of two decisions. Either you can get up and walk out of here and hope you get to come back some other time, or you can do what God would have you do. You come down here tonight. Brother Chris is going to be right down front. He knows this like he's led hundreds, thousands of people to Jesus. Come down here and take him by the hand and say to him, Preacher, I want to go to heaven. Listen, it's normal to want to go to heaven. It's right to not want to go to hell. But you've got to make a decision. You've got to step out now. Brother Chris will be down here to help you. And all you got to do is say, I want to go to heaven. It'll be the best day of your life. You'll mark down September 29, 2024 as your red letter great day if you'll come today. And I hope you will. Just come and take him by the hand. I'm going to pray. Christians, I want you to lead the way. Our Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, would you meet with us now? You've seen the hands of God more than that. You know the heart. You know we need revival. You know our burdens. You know who we love that's lost. And God, you know who in this building needs Jesus. And I pray, God, tonight all over this building, we'd respond to your will and way. Because it's in Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand. David's singing. Come on right now. Just come on right now. That's it. Come on. Come on. If you need to be saved, just come on right now and say, I'm coming. Amen. Come on right now. Hey, I'm coming.